this is a training tutorial and video manual for the Newmark Mix Stream DJ system. This is a really interesting DJ system because for a consumer price, five or 600, what you're getting here is a setup that doesn't need a laptop and that can stream directly over Wi-Fi from services like Tidal and SoundCloud and Beatport and BeatSource Link. And that can also stream from your own DJ collection if you've got that in Dropbox and from a USB or an SD card when you output your music onto one of those from your laptop where you can prepare it in a slightly more traditional way. And then DJ in the DJ booth with this with no laptop there, just using this awesome screen. It is the first such unit at a price which appeals to pretty much everyone who's serious about getting started in DJing. The units that have been like this in the past have always cost four figures and above and therefore you've got to be pretty sure that you want to be uh, doing this in order to invest in one of them. But with the Newmark Mixstream Pro, you got a chance to get going using the kind of systems that the pros use at a price which is a lot more accessible to most people. Now, if you are new to the unit but not new to DJing, then that's great. This is a full video manual and tutorial and there's a content underneath this video where you can see everything that's in it. And indeed, if you press Command or Control and F on your browser and then type in what you're looking for, and it will scroll down and highlight that part of the video. Then you can click on the timestamp and jump straight to that part of the video. This is a video manual. So I do encourage you to come back to it again and again as you need to use it. If you are new to DJing, while I can show you everything you need to know about this unit, I can talk you through all the controls, I can talk you through what everything does, where everything is and how to use it. I can't teach you in a training tutorial how to DJ because DJing is bigger than just understanding how to use your gear. If you have got the gear understanding, well, that's great, but then you also need to know how to find and arrange your music so that you've got something to play. And once you understand the gear and you've got the music, well, you need to know what to do on the gear in order to make the stuff coming out the speakers sound good. Now, once you've got all that nailed, you need to know what to do in front of other people to program the music right, to read the dance floor, and to deal with all the stuff you deal with in public. And finally, of course, if you're serious about this and you want to get gigs, you need to know how to promote yourself. And it's only when you've got all of these things in place that you'll see yourself starting to improve as a DJ. You know, when I started, I didn't have YouTube. Uh, that didn't exist. It was trial and error, and we all kind of found our way slowly over a number of years. I don't want you to do that. I want you to get there quicker. So if you are new to this, we've got a couple of things which I'll tell you about before we get started. The first one is our book, Rock the Dance Floor. You know, we're the biggest DJ school in the world, and therefore we know what beginners need in order to progress. And those five areas I just talked to you about are in the book. Now you can get this book uh, in all good bookstores. You can get it on Kindle. There's an audio book of it on uh, on Amazon and uh, Apple and so on. But I want to give you a PDF for this book as well. And I'll tell you at the end of this video how you can get a copy of this. Now we also have a course if you're serious about learning quickly how to DJ that goes into a lot more depth in those five areas. It's called the Complete DJ Course and it talks you through right from the very beginning all the gear, all the music, all the techniques you need and then onto performing and promoting yourself. I'll tell you about that course at the end as well. Now, we've got an awful lot to get through to get you up to speed with the Newmark Mix Stream Pro. So let's get started. Now, as I said a second ago, this unit can actually work with all kinds of inputs. It can work with Dropbox with your own music in it over Wi-Fi. It can work with streaming services over Wi-Fi. So you don't need music to get started. And I'll show you how you log into your favorite streaming service to do all the things I'm about to show you towards the end of this video. However, even in this day and age, I suspect that most people will want to take the music they already own and plug it into this. So let's talk about how to do that now. So around the back of the unit, you can plug in either your USB drives, your little pen drives, or an SD card. Uh, and the SD card slot is quite nice because it goes flush with the unit and then it's kind of in there semi-permanently. Uh, I like to use an SD card with units like this, but whichever one you use, the way you get the music into it is by downloading the Engine DJ desktop app from from the enginedj.com website and installing that onto your laptop. And in doing so, you can then import your music from your iTunes or from your hard drive and process that music and analyze that music and prepare it so that it's all ready to use on this unit. You don't have to do that. You can just throw a load of MP3s onto a drive and not use any software and plug them in the back, but it is best to prepare them on the desktop software. So once you've done that and you've put them onto a USB or an SD card, you're gonna plug it into the back of the unit 
and then your playlist and your tracks will all show. Now the unit does come with some tracks kind of built in that you can play with and that's what I'm going to be showing you in this video tutorial. Now this button here takes you to the source menu and anything you've got plugged in shows here and just a little word when you want to remove a drive just like on a computer you're meant to unmount your drives before you rip them out of the back of the computer uh, there is a little symbol on the right hand side here for any USBs you've got plugged in just tap that and it will unmount the USB uh, before you pull it out so that you don't accidentally corrupt the database on your USB drive making it harder to use in the future. So let's talk through what I'm going to show you because I want you to know how this is going to progress now that you know how to get the music into your, into your unit or onto your unit. The way I'm going to talk you through this is very quickly going through all the features of the unit. You know, there's an awful lot of stuff on here, an awful lot of buttons and knobs and faders and so on. So I'll talk you through the features of the unit very, very quickly. We won't go into too much detail about how all of those work. Once we've had a look at the features, we'll go into more detail. So then we'll talk about how to actually use it. I'll talk you through how to use the touch screen. I'll talk you through basic performance. So how to load tracks and search and filter, edit your playlists and uh, use the pads and the sync mode and all that kind of stuff. And then we'll move on and look at the control center and I'll show you all the different parameters that are in here that you can adjust to get this working how you want to and finally we'll end up by looking at a pretty uh, awesome feature of this which is lighting this can control lighting so it can either control consumer lighting Philips Hue basically the smart light system from Philips or it can control via DMX which is a professional lighting control um, um, system uh, real lighting, like proper lighting that you find in clubs and so on. I won't be going into how to control club lighting in this tutorial. I think that's going to be too much for most people. And just to remind you, uh, you can hit command or control and F and scroll down underneath YouTube. We've got a full indexed contents of everything that's coming up in this video. So if you do want to skip ahead or move around or come back to it to look at something you've forgotten, you can click in there to find the thing that you want. So we're going to start off now then by talking through the features of the unit. And to talk through the features, let Let's start with the top panel. So this is the touch screen. This is the center of your unit. It's full color, it's multi-touch, and it shows information relevant to what you're doing on the unit at any particular time. Uh, you can use the touch screen to move through it, but you can also use some of the controls that are around the touch screen as well. So you do have a choice sometimes about how you use it. Now, I just touched one of those controls. This is the browse knob. You turn this to navigate through lists, for instance, through lists of tunes, as you can see I'm doing here. Uh, you press the knob to move forward in the touch screen or to select a song to load onto a deck. So if I wanted to load that song onto a deck, for instance, uh, I can now, having touched it, pick a deck and the song loads onto a deck. As I say, we'll talk a lot more about how this stuff works later. If you want to take a track and put it into what is called a prepare window, which is a bit like pulling records halfway out of a record box. In other words, you're preparing songs that you might want to play later. You can hold down the shift button and press it and that will put the selected track into your prepare window. So let's talk about how to uh, load onto the decks. You actually just saw me do that, but let's do it again. Uh, I'm gonna press the button down and I'm gonna load it this time onto deck one. So last time I pressed the number two, now I'm gonna press the number one and this track is now loaded onto deck one. So that's how to load your tracks onto the decks. If you double click this button, it will quickly load the track that's playing on the other deck to the other one and have it playing at the same speed and from the same place and that's called instant doubles and it's something that scratch DJs like in order to quickly load two copies of the same track. Uh, there's a button here called back this will take you back to wherever you were before uh, and pressing this will take you forward so you kind of like got a forward and back buttons there uh, and these two buttons here load one and load two We'll load the track onto deck one and deck two in the same way you just saw me doing on the screen. So there's another example of you get a choice of whether you use hardware buttons or the screen to load things. And it doesn't make any difference which one you do. So there's a button with the word view on it here. And this will give you either this view here or this view here, which is the full library view. So it's gonna cycle through. This is called the performance view here, this one. So if you hold down shift and press the view button, then you get this view. So now in the performance mode, we've got our waveforms 
horizontally. The waveform is the vis visual representation of the track. And the waveforms are now horizontal instead of vertical. And some people prefer it that way. Uh, but the disadvantage of having it that way is you don't get this mini library in the middle that you can see when we have the waveforms set vertically. So it's up to you how you have that, but shift and view will let you do that. Now, uh, you saw me do this a little bit earlier. This is called the source button. And pressing this will take us onto the source uh, demo tracks is what we've got loaded at the moment. But any sources you have plugged in the back, SD cards and so on will be in there as will any streaming services that you are logged into and we'll talk a little bit more about how to get those streaming services up and running shortly. So if you press the control center button which is this one here it will take you to this which is called the control center. Let's zoom in on that a little bit so you can see it better. So the control center is where we have all kinds of controls where you can quickly adjust things that you use commonly, uh, such as Wi-Fi, uh, the source that you've got plugged in. You can record your sets from here. We'll talk through all of this later. There's a few other common things here. And from here, you can also get into other areas such as your user profile uh, and the settings for the unit itself, which can all be adjusted. And we'll be going through these in a lot more detail a little bit later on. So let's get out of there again now and back to here. Uh, let's talk through now some of the other functions and buttons that are going on around here. So let's move down here. So these are our channel level faders, which is going to give us the volume on the individual track. And these are a second channel volume control. These are the channel levels. So these are to kind of set your level permanently to where you want it. Normally you'll leave this around 12 o'clock. And then these are for adjusting in the mix to get everything sounding great when you're actually DJing. Uh, so in other words, you're gonna want these two set so that whatever you're listening to are around the same volume. As I say, leaving that about 12 o'clock is probably good for a beginner and don't worry too much about it. But if you have a track that's particularly loud, you might wanna turn it down a bit or particularly quiet, you might wanna turn that one up a little bit. We have channel EQ, which is bass and treble, but they also have a extra one in the middle, which is called mid, which is usual for DJ systems to give you three equalizer controls. So uh, this is playing through the built-in speakers, so it won't sound too good on my microphone, but enough for me to show you. There's the bass down. There's the treble up and there's the mid-range with the bass, without the bass, and so on. So these are going to give you the ability to tweak the sound, either to make it just sound better overall, or to make it sound better when you're actually mixing, when maybe you don't want to have, for instance, the bass playing on two tracks at once. So that's what they do. Now this is called the filter, and a filter will give you a very musical effect. Again, this is just coming through the built-in speakers, but it's enough for you to hear what it does. If you are a fan of house music, you will have heard that used an awful lot. Now these are our toggle switches to turn the effects on and off. These are the built-in effects, and the effects are ways of making the audio sound, well, cooler, really. So that's called a, a flanger. That's called a phaser. That's an echo. I'm turning that on and off so you can hear it. And this one's a delay. You can hear that delayed the track, giving us a little kind of delay, one delay of the track as it plays. And these knobs here will either turn the effect on or off for each of the two decks, or they'll hold it on just momentarily while you press the knob down. These are called paddles, and that's what they do. They're designed to either put it on permanently or put it on just while you want it on while you're holding it. These are beloved of scratch DJs who uh, basically it kind of invented this kind of control but they're now really really uh common uh, and they kind of trickle down from scratch dj gear to gear like this it's a really nice immediate way of controlling effects so let's move on then we've now talked about the effects area and we've talked about the eqs and the volumes uh, let's talk about one of the most important parts of a dj controller it's a crossfader the job of the crossfader is to move what you're doing from one track to the other. I've got two tracks loaded up here. Uh, I can have them both playing and I can use this to go between the two of them or to mix them together. The crossfader is one of the most important controls, especially on a two 
channel DJ controller, which is what this is, or DJ system, which is what this is, because it's a very easy way with one hand of doing the equivalent of that. Bringing one in and turning the other one off. You can do the whole thing with one hand, leaving the other hand free to do something else. The meters here are very important. I've already told you about the levels and about how these adjust how loud the track is. The meters will show you that. So on this particular track here, this meter is showing me that now that's probably too loud and that's probably about right. So the meters are an important way of making sure that what you're listening to isn't likely to be too loud and distorting. Keep them out of the red, or in the case of this, because the style on this controller is to have, on this system is to have red LEDs and a white one at the top. Keep them as loud as possible, but out of the white. Uh, they are showing you the main output volume as controlled by everything you have set here and another volume control, the main control up here. So, I've got a set of headphones here. How do we control the headphones? Well, the headphones have got really two roles in DJing, and let's talk about those roles very quickly. The first role is to let you preview the track that is, you're gonna be hearing to see if you want to play it. You can put the headphones on like this, and you can play the other track to the one the audience is hearing, and you can be like, do I wanna play that? Yeah. And the second role is to, when you're beat mixing, if you want to beat mix without using some of the controls that make it easier for you here, which we'll talk about in a little while, if you're beat mixing and you want to beat mix the old fashioned way, the way vinyl turntable DJs used to do it, uh, you would traditionally have your headphones on and put one over one ear and the other ear will be listening to the speaker. And that way you'll be able to listen to the track you're mixing in here and the track that's playing to the audience here. And as you blend them together, you can be just checking that they're at the same speed and speeding up and slowing down the, the track you're bringing in to check that that remains the case. So in order to hear then in your headphones, the track that the audience isn't hearing, we need some special controls. And so the controls that do that are the headphone preview buttons. And the headphone preview buttons are that one there for this deck and this one here for this deck. When you press that button, what goes through your headphones will be the source whose button you have pressed. So there is also a headphones mix knob, and that is right up here in the top left-hand corner. The headphones mix knob decides how much of what you are listening to, based upon what's set here, you hear, and how much of what everyone else is hearing you hear. If this knob is turned all the way to the left, then all you hear in the headphones is whatever you've got selected here. If it's turned all the way to the right, then whatever you've got selected here doesn't make any difference at all because this is saying, play what the audience is hearing through the headphones. And if you have it in the middle, you're getting a bit of both. Now this is actually quite a useful feature because if you want to practice at home and you can't even turn the speakers up that are built into this thing or whatever, you want to practice DJing at home, then you might only be able to use your headphones. And then you can put your headphones on and have that knob set to what the audience is hearing. Uh, and then when you want to perform a mix, you can turn it the other way, perform the mix and then turn it back again. But really what's happening is uh, the, the main output, so say you were recording that set, the thing that would be recorded would be what the again, quote unquote, audience would be hearing. So it's a nice way of basically doing everything in your headphones at times when maybe your family's in bed and you wanna have a DJ practice late at night or whatever. So that's the headphones mix button. Let's get back to our talk around at the top of the unit. This is simply the volume control for the headphones so you don't deafen yourself. Um, then we're gonna move on to look at the actual decks themselves now. So these are, past the crossfader, probably the most important part. These are called the platters or the jog wheels, really. Uh, the jog wheels are touch sensitive controls that control where what happens to the track that's playing. Now I'm gonna hit the play button, I'll tell you about this in a minute here. If I touch the top there, you can see that that has stopped playing and you can hear that it stopped playing. I take my finger off it, it starts again. If I touch the edge and move it, you can see in here, that it's slowing the track down. And that is the purpose of the platter. It is to control where the, the audio playhead is the line here. It's to control where the audio playhead is, moving it forward or back or nudging it as we're playing the track slowly forward and back through the track. Now you saw, or rather you heard me scratching there, like this. 
And this scratch button here is your friend when it comes to scratching because this unit has something called Smart Scratch built in. And Smart Scratch lets you do scratch movements while the track remembers where it would have been had you not done the scratch movement. And it's easier to demonstrate this than to talk about it. If that's playing, If you watch the waveform here, when I stop that, the bottom half of the waveform keeps going. And this is showing me where the track would be had I not stopped it. Now when I take my hand off it, it'll carry on from where it would have been. And that means I can do scratch movements but the track will carry on playing how it would have been playing if I hadn't done that. And that's useful because if you've got two tracks playing together and you want to do a bit of scratching, but you then want to like step away and the tracks continue to play along together, that will let you do it. On other DJ systems, that's sometimes called slip mode, but that's what that does. It turns scratch on so that you can have the track playing away underneath in inverted commas uh, while you're scratching. And you can tap that button again to turn that off and then it will just work like a normal turntable and it will leave the track uh, where, where, where you left it when you finished scratching. So you have those two options there. Another option on that button, if you hold down the shift button and there's a shift button on each side, which does give you a few extra controls on this unit as you'll find out as we talk through. If you hold down the shift button and hold the scratch button uh, for a little while, then you get this set up on the screen here, which lets you adjust what's called the beat grid. And the beat grid is the way the unit has analyzed your track to figure out where the beats and bars are. And these little lines by the beats are the beat grid, and it helps the unit to sync your music up. But if the beat grid's a bit wrong, when we're in this mode, we can use the jog wheel to move the grid, and you can see the grid is moving there underneath the track. And you can press this button here to let you do that. Pressing it again will take you out of that mode. So let's talk now about some of these buttons and the biggest button out of this lot really, certainly the most talked about one, is the sync button. The sync button is this one here and this one here. Uh, pressing the sync button will activate sync for that deck which syncs whatever you're doing on, on that deck with what's, what's happening on the other deck. I can turn it on on the other deck there as well. Uh, and you can press it again to turn it off. You can also have it set so that the shift button and pressing it again will turn it off. It's up to you and you can change that in the settings, whichever one you prefer. They'll both do the same thing. Sync just makes it an awful lot easier, especially as a beginner, to get two tracks playing at once. And there's absolutely no stigma when it comes to using sync. Sync is doing something for you that you could do yourself quite easily, but it would take a little bit of time. So pressing a button frees you up to do something more interesting with your time when DJing than having to sync the tracks up manually in the way we used to have to do back in the days when we played with vinyl. A few more buttons around here then. The play pause button is this one here. It plays when you touch it. And when you press it again, it pauses right where you are so that you press it one more time and it'll continue from exactly where you left off. Now, if you press and hold the shift button and then press play, play pause, it starts the track playing from the temporary cue point. So what's the temporary cue point? Well, let's talk about that because that's what the other button does. So if your track is playing, pressing the cue button will jump back to the temporary cue point and wait. As opposed to what I just showed you, holding down shift and pressing the play button will jump back to the temporary cue button and play or the temporary cue marker and play. If the track is paused, when we press the cue button, it will move the cue, the temporary cue, to where the track was paused. So if you want to move the temporary cue point, you press it when the track's paused, and if you want to jump to it and wait, you press it when the track is playing. And if you want to jump to it and play, you hold down shift and press play. Why do we have a temporary cue? Because it's a very easy way of putting a mark on a track where we want to mix it in from. The track might have all kinds of stuff going on, and then finally the beat arrives, so when you load a track onto your deck when you're DJing, you can quickly go to where you want to mix it in and hit that cue button, and it will remember that, so you can jump back to there several times when you're DJing in that particular transition or mix or whatever. So it's just a very convenient control to have. Finally, if you hold down shift and press Q, 
instead of shift and play, it will take you to the beginning of the track, which is something that I've always wanted these systems to do. And they finally added it in version 2.0, this software, which is the one that's running on it at the time of recording this. So well done for adding that, thank you. Now the next control to show you is the pitch fader. It's this one here, and each deck has one. The pitch fader changes the pitch of the track, making it sound higher or lower, but really what it's doing to do that is altering the tempo or the speed of the track. So if I start this track playing here, that slowed it down an awful lot to the point where it stopped. And that speeded it up an awful lot as well. Now this is useful when you're beat mixing your tracks because it lets you get them in the same tempo, especially as I was talking about earlier, if you don't want to use the sync button or for some reason, you want to use that as a creative tool. That's what that control is for. Do note though, uh, that you push it away from you for the speed to go down, which might be a bit counterintuitive if you haven't used systems like this before. Moving it towards you makes it go up. Now that was quite an extreme movement. You can alter the percentage change when you do that, it's currently set to 100%, by holding down shift and pressing either the plus or minus here, the minus will make it less. So now I'll set it to uh, plus or minus 8%. And you can hear not only is the pitch going up and down, but the tempo is, but nowhere near as much as before. Now there are two buttons here, plus and minus, that I just showed you using with shift, but if you press these on their own without pressing shift, it's similar to doing this. See, I'm slowing down the track. We've already looked at this and speeding it up. You can have these buttons do this for you as well. Some DJs prefer using the buttons as a way of nudging the tracks together if they're in the mix together and they're slipping apart slightly. So they want to speed one up or slow one down. Those buttons are there to facilitate you doing that. Now these are the performance pads. I'm not gonna tell you uh, exactly how these work now. I'll save that to operation a little bit later on. Uh, but briefly, they have four functions. The first function is Q. This enters the Q mode, which lets you put different Q points. You saw the track there jumping to different places in the track. They're called Q points. So while you've got one temporary Q here, these ones are more permanent. You can store these with the track and they're there when you come back to it. Pressing this again gives you four more. So even though there's only four buttons here, we've actually got eight cue points that we can save onto these buttons. Saved loops enters the save loop mode. Uh, here, we can press a button in order to start a loop on a track and then press it again in order to finish the loop and it will save it into one of these slots. Again, we have eight of them by pressing it again. And I'll show you how to use these a little bit later on. Auto loop is auto loop mode, which has preset loop length. So you can loop a bit of the track to a preset length, which can sound really cool. Uh, and again, pressing it again will give you more settings there. And loop roll is another loop function. This one will uh, give you different lengths of loops that will play but with the same kind of functionality that I showed you with the special scratch button here. It'll play the little loop, but then when you're finished, the track will continue playing where it would have been had you not pressed the loop buttons. So we've got two different ways of using loops here. Now look where my left hand is. We haven't talked about these yet. One of the outstanding points of this unit is the fact that it's got speakers built in. Uh, we've been listening to the music through them. Uh, these are the speakers. Maybe a strange place to have the speakers. Uh, really, if you're practicing DJing, they're a little bit closer to your ears than if they're up here, I guess. But anyway, that's where they put the speakers. Uh, and these are built in. They have their own volume control up here, which is different to the main output volume control, which is the one that sends the signals through the output uh, output sockets at the back, which we'll have a look at in a second in order to go to any external speakers that you might have plugged in and they have their own speaker volume there. So let's now have a look at the front panel. Now there's very little going on on the front panel of this unit really. We have our headphones sockets. This is where my headphones are plugged in with this little eight inch socket but an 88 eighth inch plug, there's a quarter inch plug here as well. So you don't have to remember an adapter for your headphones or if your headphones don't unscrew into one of these, you've got the bigger one to plug them into there as well. Then we also have a microphone input here uh, and you can plug a microphone here as long as it's got a TRS plug on it. 
and it will then be controlled with the volume control that's here as well. That'll just kind of basically go straight through the unit and straight out the back. You've got no other controls for the microphone other than that volume control there, but you do have that microphone option. Uh, you can adjust things about how the microphone works in the settings menu. We'll have a look at how to adjust that in a little while. So let's take a look around the back and then we'll have finished our talk through of the features of this unit. So starting on the left hand side, these are our XLR balanced outputs where you can plug in XLR cables to connect to loudspeakers or amplifiers. These are good to see. You don't often see these on this type of unit that's aimed at this type of market. So it's nice to see those. Uh, these are our more traditional outputs, these are RCA outputs that I've got plugged in here to our external speakers. So you have two choices there of plugging in your external speakers. That said, they're both controlled by the main volume control at the top here. However, if you wanted to have two of these going off to a PA system and two of these going to speakers nearer to you to use as what DJs call booth monitors, you could do that. You would then just use the volume controls on the powered speakers that you plugged in as your booth monitors to give you an independent volume control for one of them while using the main volume control for the other one. We've already talked about the existence of these, now I'm showing them to you. Here's the SD card slot for plugging in music. These are two USB-A inputs where you can plug in your drives. Typically it will be a pen drive um, that have got music on as well. No difference between how these work, they're just different formats. And this is for plugging in to a computer. And finally, we have our input here. This little thing here is to let you screw the cable onto the unit to save it being pulled out by mistake. So that's quite a nice thing to have if you're in a situation where you're worried that that's gonna get yanked out when you're DJing. And finally, we have the power on off button here. So now we've looked at the controls of the unit. You're aware of what the features are, what they do. We're gonna move on to operations and we're gonna start by looking at the operations of the touch screen. This is the track overview and waveform screen, which is the screen that you're probably gonna be using most of the time when you're DJing. It's got a good mix of library features and waveform features, which means that whether you're looking for a track to play or whether you're just having fun mixing tracks, this view is a good all-rounder. There are views that prefer the library and there are views that prefer the waveforms, which we'll talk about, but this is a good all-rounder. So we'll look at this one first, the track overview and waveform screen. So what have we got here? Well, we have got across the top, a toolbar. Probably easier if I use a pen to show you. This is called the toolbar. We've got the track overviews. This is showing you the whole track. We've got the little symbols here which show you whether your key is locked, whether your track is looping, and if so, uh, by how many beats it's looping. Uh, we have numbers down the side, which are probably too small to see on the camera, that are telling you how many bars we are from the, the main cue point in the track. Well, we've also got the main playhead, which is this white line that's showing where we are on the track at the moment. Were we to hit play, that's where it would play from. Uh, we've got little symbols down here, which tell us if the sync button is on or off. We'll talk to you about all of these things a little bit more, a lot of these things a little bit more uh, in a while. Uh, we have the BPM, we have the time elapsed, we have the currently selected musical key here. Then in the, if I go to the beginning of this track here, you can see this little triangle here, which is a cue point, and that's showing us where we've got our cue points set, which are set using the pads, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, we can also jump to our loops. This is a loop here, it says intro loop, uh, and these are shown on the waveforms as well, so we can see where we've got loops set in the tracks. And we've also got this big area in the middle here, which is a shrunk down version of the library. Before we uh, go any further then, let's look a bit more closely at some of these things. So firstly, the waveforms at the top. So as I said, these are showing you the whole track. You can see your cue points are marked on the waveforms. You can also see your loops are marked on the waveforms. And it's the beginning of the track to the end of the track. Whoops, I've jumped out of that view there. Let me just jump back to it. Uh, so it's going from the beginning of the track to the end of the track. And you can tap into here to move around very quickly in the track. You want to go near the end of the track, you can go to there and you can see the waveform is moving to show me a zoom in on the place that I've just tapped. Tap right back at the beginning there, we're very near the beginning of the track again. This is an easy way to jump to where you want to go. Now it only works when the track is paused, but you can change it in the settings for it to work when the track's playing as well. The reason it's not set like that by default is so you don't accident accidentally tap it while you're DJing and jump into a place of the track which you didn't, didn't expect to or want to. So 
We can zoom in on the main waveforms just by pinching and spreading our fingers like this. And you can see they both change at the same time when we do this. You're probably gonna find a place that you like to have these set and then that'll be you set up fine. You know, the more you go like this, the more of the track you can see coming up, the more you go like this, the more granular you can see what's happening, but at the expense of not being able to see too much of what's coming up in the track. That's something, as I say, you'll probably set and forget. Now, other things that I've talked to you about that you might want to have a view on, one of them is the track elapsed time, uh, which is this here. Tapping it will give you the time left. And it works for both. You do it, do it on one, it'll show you both. So at the moment, we're three minutes, 36 seconds into this track, and we're four minutes and three seconds into this track. By tapping on that, it tells me I've got 43 seconds left on that track and two minutes left on this track. I prefer to have these set so it's telling me the time left. I find that a more useful thing to know, but you'll uh, have a view on that, set it, and again, you'll probably forget it once you've done that. Now, another important setting here is this one. This little musical note is telling us whether the key lock is switched on for that deck. Now, this is important because if the key lock is switched off, as we've seen, when we slow or speed the track up, it gets higher and lower. But with the key lock switched on and you tap this and it goes green, now that's not gonna happen. Now when we slow and speed the track up, it gets faster and slower, but it's not getting higher and lower. In other words, this is locking the pitch on for you. So this is worth knowing about because you can't change the key of the track without that being switched on. To change the key of the track, we tap its musical key, and that's what this is here. This is the Camelot key notation, and this is telling you this is in key 4A. So if I tap this at the top here, I get a chance to change this up or down to different keys. If I change it down, we're now on a different musical key and up as well. But if this isn't switched on, that won't work. So do be aware of that little key button. Now to switch to the view where we get to see horizontal waveforms, remember I showed you this a little bit earlier, but I'll show it you again now. Hold down shift and hold the view button. And then we switch to this view here, where we get these bigger horizontal waveforms, but at the expense of the internal library that was in the middle section, we can switch to see the full library taking up all the screen, which I will show you in a minute. And some people prefer to DJ, me included, using this when you're DJing, and just very quickly switching to the library when you need to load another track. But other people prefer it in the view where you get both together and you're not constantly switching screens. Again, it's gonna be up to you how you play that one. So back on this screen then, let's talk again about what happens down the middle with these tunes. Swiping a tune to the left, we'll load it to the left hand deck and it says load left, release to accept. Swiping, swiping it to the right, we'll load it to the right hand deck and it says load uh, right, release to accept. And if you wanna scroll through the tunes, you just go up and down like this, or if there are a lot of tunes here, I've only got the five demo tunes here loaded, but if there are a lot of tunes here, uh, it's easier to just touch the right hand side and you can very quickly scroll through the tunes. And actually it turns out that you can go through really, really big library by just touching the right hand side scroll bar and very quickly moving through them. And I've had a library of eight or 900 tunes and found it very, very easy to move through them on here. So that is the tip rather than quickly going like this and trying to scroll through the tunes like this, it's easier to use the bar that appears down the right hand side. Now there's lots of ways to load a track. You can, uh, I've just shown you one, you can double tap on it as well, like that. And then you can select the deck one or two to load from there. Uh, or as I showed you at the beginning, you can press the browse button uh, and then it will say, select deck to load. So there's lots of ways of loading a track onto one of your decks. Again, you're just gonna end up doing one of those and sticking with it, I would guess. Something that's really cool here, and this even works with streaming tracks, is that you can tap on the artwork. The artwork is a little picture to the left-hand side. And when you tap on the artwork, you get this little play button. And this is now playing in my headphones. If I hold it to my microphone here, you'll hear it. Where's my mic? You'll probably hear that a little bit, at least. It's playing in my headphones that track. And that's really cool because that means that you can, from here, preview the track 
without having to mess around with anything else. So I can jump through the track then by tapping the track name. It's almost like a, a hidden waveform. You can see that I'm moving through the track here to listen to it. It's a really nice feature that, and it's something that not all DJ systems have. So certainly something that you should, uh, you should make the most of. Now, a couple of other things on here that we haven't talked about yet. At the very top here is the toolbar. The toolbar is this bit across the top. You see where it says browse and search, and then you've got a few symbols here. This is the toolbar, and this is something that can shortcut you to the library. Uh, you do that by pressing browse. So now we're on the full library view. Uh, it can also give you the search function. If I tap on search there, we're now in the full library view, but we've got a keyboard to search our tracks. I'll show you a little bit more uh, later on how search works, but also it has some status at the top here. It's got a clock to tell you the current time and you can change the time in the settings. Your current Wi-Fi status, we're not connected at the moment. And Q is for quantize, and this enables time-based functions. So cues and loops and so on will snap nice and neatly to the beat grids, in other words, to the beats on your tracks and make you sound good when you're DJing. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, there's another little icon that will appear at the top there if it's switched on, which is a continuous play icon that tells you that the, the tracks will play one after the other. When one track finishes, another one will be mixed in and that's used for the auto playlist, which again, I'm going to talk to you about in a little while. If you have Ableton Link switched on, which we'll see in the settings when we go and have a look at them later, then a little symbol will appear where my thumb is there at the top here, uh, around here somewhere, which just tells you an Ableton Link is a great way of linking your units to Ableton Live or to other Ableton Link enabled gear to keep everything in sync, like for drum machines and so on. So it's cool that that's on here. Now, talking about library view, let's switch over to it now and have a closer look at it. So this is the main library view. There's no waveforms on display here. This is purely the music that you've got available to you. Down the left-hand side, this is the source button. This lets you choose what you're going to play. At the moment, the only source we've got plugged in here is our demo tracks, but we could switch to Beatport Link, Beat Source Link, SoundCloud, Tidal, Dropbox, or if I had a USB in the back of the unit, we could switch to that there. So this is where we can quickly change sources because maybe you want to play something next that isn't in the source that you're currently playing. Maybe you're playing a local tune and you wanna play from a streaming service or so on. That's how you switch. The next one down is playlists. And playlists will take you to your playlists that are set up on the device. And I'll show you how to make a playlist in a minute. Uh, the next one down is your prepare window. Let's just jump back to the browse window there. It's your prepare window here. And these are the tracks that you have sent to the prepare folder in order to play from. So if you don't wanna play five or six tracks for the next 20 minutes, you can quickly prepare them and pop them into that folder there, and then they will be ready for you when you tap on there. Uh, there's nothing in the prepare folder at the moment. History lets you look at the stuff you've played in the past, and now that this has got a clock on it, which Engine didn't have until the current version, uh, it means that you can get timestamps on your history, which is much better because you can then quickly look back to what you played at 10 p.m. last Saturday, for instance, in a way you couldn't with the old one. Uh, the Folders view will take you into the files and folders structure on anything you've got plugged in here. So uh, in the same way that on your computer operating system, you know, you can go to your C drive and your user and your, your documents and so on. You can browse through music that's plugged into this on SDs and USBs by going to the files view there. And finally, the search, we've already had a look at search. Uh, you can reach search from up here, but also you can reach search from down at the bottom here as well. Uh, in order to search through your playlists and so on. So we'll talk more about searching in a little while. Uh, I just wanted to show you some of these things now. Uh, we have got a few other functions around this side that are gonna help you with the playlist. The first one is this little line view here. Again, probably best if I show you using this. Uh, and this toggles between the view we're looking at now and this one where it squeezes in more tracks. So if we had more tracks here, you know, we'd probably be looking at 10 tracks on the screen there rather than the, the five or six that are filling the, the, the screen up there. On this seven inch screen, for this particular unit, this Newmark Mixstream Pro, that view is very small. I find that, and admittedly I'm not as young as I used to be, my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. I find this very, very hard to see. But if you don't, this is cool. Uh, this is a nice way of seeing more tunes. And you do have that choice there between the two font sizes. You also have the extra information about the track available to you just by holding on it. 
I held on that for a second and you can see here we've got all the info that's in this unit about the track. We've got the waveform, sorry, the uh, artwork bigger, we've got the BPM and the key and the length and all the what's called metadata. The track name, the artist, the genre, the label, the year, the album, where it is, you know, the, the, the file path to it and the actual name of it. And you can even have comments in here as well. So this is a good way to store extra information about your tracks in order to be able to look at that when you're DJing. Now, it's slightly different on this view when it comes to swiping to load tracks, because on this view, if you swipe it to the right, you get that usual load choice, one or two. It doesn't load it to the right-hand deck. It gives you the choice of one or two. And the reason for that is if you swipe to the left from here, it adds it to the prepare window. And this says prepare, release to accept. That's now added to the prepare window. And if I swipe this one to the right, it will add that to the prepare window as well. Now, another thing we can do when we're in a playlist here is we can go to this button here, which says play as playlist. And this will let us go to either deck one or two, and it will play everything in that playlist on that deck without you having to do anything else. It's a great way if you need to put a playlist on at the beginning of a the night, there's no one there, you just want some music playing. You can have a very early night warm up playlist and you can do that chuck it on and the, the unit will cut out the gaps between the tracks and play your early playlist for you there. And again, it's something that wasn't in the earlier version of Engine that's in this one and that's on the Mix Stream Pro. And it's a really cool thing to have. I'll talk to you a bit more about how this play as playlist works in a little while. So I wanna show you how to search the tracks now in a bit more detail. So to search the tracks, we tap the search field, which is actually visible on this view here. So we don't have to tap, tap, tap the search icon at the top here because there's a search field at the top here. To search, we tap the search field and that keyboard appears on the screen again. And we can use this to uh, search. We have got lots of criteria that we can type in as far as search goes to what we want to search. So in, for instance, on this view here, if we tap the little triangle at the top, here's what we're currently searching, title and artist. But you can also search by album length, key, comment, BPM, genre, label, year, date added, uh, or even file name. Uh, it takes a little bit longer to search depending on how many of these you have turned on. So only turn on what you're looking for, but it can be very useful if you're searching for all the tracks in one genre or all the tracks in one key or whatever to use that little drop down there to choose what you're searching for. So we'll leave it in that current setting uh, and I'll start to type in a track higher uh, and there we go. The only track I've got out of those five that's got HI somewhere in its Metadata is this one, Higher by Volex. You'll see that it filtered the tracks as I was typing things in. So quite often, most of the time, you'll find you don't even get to the end of the word you're typing to try and find a track because it's filtering as it goes along in order for you to find that. And now, if you wanna get rid of the keyboard, you just you tap either this little keyboard icon at the bottom here, uh, which will get rid of it, or you just tap somewhere where the keyboard isn't on the screen and it'll get rid of it that way. Now, you can filter your search results as well. So imagine there was more than one track there. We could filter our search results here using these filters here. Now we've got a search result. So for instance, I could have filtered everything in the key of 8A and then filtered by the genre, so house. So then very quickly, I've got all my house tracks in the key of 8A there. So combining searching with filtering is quite a powerful way of filtering stuff. And indeed, in the settings, you can say you don't want uh, the unit to show you anything that isn't in the same key or with it or a compatible key or within a certain number of BPMs. So whenever you're searching, uh, you're always gonna get tracks that are e reasonably easy to beat mix because they're close by in BPM and also in a compatible musical key if you want. That's something you can set when you're getting advanced at this, especially when you've got a big library and if you're into key mixing and so on, that does give you some extra uh, quick ways of finding something to play next. Now again, when we've only got five tracks loaded, it's a bit academic, but the BPM at the top here, if I tap on here, I can sort by anything here. I can put these tracks into any order I want. So if my search results have given me 30 tracks, I can very quickly put them into BPM order to order them from fastest to slowest, for instance. So again, it's just a good way of very quickly moving through your tracks. And you, you'll get quite competent of searching, filtering, uh, and then very quickly getting your, your search results into an order in order to help you find what you want. It is a very nice way of quickly finding something to play next. And as you get used to it, as I say, you'll find it's intuitive and you won't miss 
the laptop if you're used to laptop DJing after a short while. Um, and that's one of the nice things about engine software that it has enough of that usability in it to mean that you, you probably won't miss the laptop too much. Now it's possible to make your own playlists and to make folders for playlists as well. And so why would you want to do this? Well, you can make temporary playlists on the unit, which you can then play from. It's worth pointing out that they won't be sent back to the main software. So if you're using this unit out and about DJing and you're making playlists and so on, once you get back home, if you're using your laptop to organize your music, you can't get those playlists back to the laptop version of the software. So they're, they're pretty much semi-permanent. Um, you, you're going to end up with playlists on here that you haven't got on there and so on. Uh, but nonetheless, they have got the ability to build playlists here. So let's have a look at how that works now. So in order to make playlists, you're editing. And to edit, you need to click this little icon here with a few lines and a pen on it. Now, once I've done that, I've got these little dots here next to the tracks. And that's a select dot. So by clicking on select, I'm selecting my tracks. There you go, I've selected two tracks there. Now, by clicking on playlists, I can now click this create playlists button at the bottom, or create playlist, and we'll give it a name. I'll call it our test playlist, and it'll create a playlist down here. Now, it's not doing this now because I haven't got a card plugged into the unit, but once that's happened, when you've got your USB plugged in, you can grab the tracks here and drag them into it, and then you can do all the kind of things that I was just talking to you about, reordering and so on, of the tracks in that playlist in just the same way that you can do anywhere else. So the playlist, once they're built, you can put them into BPM order, uh, you can search them and all that kind of stuff. It's all built into the unit. But as I say, just remember, you can't then export those playlists back to your master library on the laptop. Uh, so I, I find using the prepare window is probably the best way of organizing your music on the unit because you're not gonna be making work that you then lose. The prepare window is designed to be temporary anyway. So. Let's have a closer look at the play as playlist or the playlist deck. So I've got this, let's unselect those. Now I've got this set of tracks here. Let's say I wanna play these on deck two. So it says here in words that are probably too small for you to read, playlist, playback is paused. To start playback, press play on deck two. And when I do that, it's now started to play the tracks that you can see down here in this playlist and it's playing through these tracks on that deck. And there they are playing there. And it's not needing me to be there for that to happen. These tracks are just gonna play through and through and through. So when you've enabled this, you can automatically crossfade between the tracks according to the playlist deck crossfade parameter. And that's something that you can set in the settings. We're going to talk through all the settings and the user profile stuff in the menus in a bit. But that's one of those things that you can set and say, you know, I want the crossfade to be three seconds between my tracks and so on. Uh, so that's just going to carry on playing now until the end of that list. You can skip through the tracks that are playing and you use these skip buttons here to do this. Obviously, the middle button is going to be your play pause for the currently playing playlist. And to get rid of the playlist that's playing on that deck, you just press the cross in the top corner there and it will warn you that you're gonna stop playback. And now we've got our deck back for normal DJing. Let's look at how sync works with two tracks loaded onto the decks. So in order to turn sync on, we press the sync button on the deck we want to be what's called the master deck. And that means it's the deck which is the other one's lead. So for instance, this one is set to 124 BPM. I press sync on here and press play. Now this deck here, whatever it's set to on its pitch fader, will be overridden when I hit the sync button. It's currently set to 165 on its pitch fader. When I hit that, it jumps to 124 to put into line with this one. Now I can start that one playing and both tracks are in sync with each other. This little sign here is telling us that sync is switched on when it's set green. To switch sync off, because at this moment, either of these pitch controls will speed up or slow down both tracks. To switch that off, we either turn sync off or we press shift and sync, depending on how that's set in the settings. And I'll show you in a little while how to make that change. 
I want to talk you through now, we looked at where they were earlier, but I want to actually now with a, a track playing, talk you through how the performance pads works, how you can use that cue, save loop, auto loop and roll to uh, affect your performances. So let's, uh, let's do that now. We'll start off by looking at cue mode. Now remember to enter a mode for these four pads to do what you want them to do, you press the button above. So in this instance, I want to enter cue mode. I don't need to do anything because cue is already lit here and we're now in cue mode. You can now use these pads to jump to assign cue modes and that's what I'm doing there. Jumping to the first cue point, which is marked here as the intro cue. Jumping to the drop cue, which is marked here. The breakdown, which is marked here. And the outro cue, which is marked here. These have their names on them because they've been set in engine DJ desktop software. You can't name your cue points here. When you add cue points here, they just get added as numbers. And I'll show you how to add cue points now. So these four are already used. But remember, there are eight cues here. Just because we can't see all eight, that doesn't mean there aren't. Press the button again, and we're now on to cues five to eight. So here, I'm gonna set a new cue point on this one here, cue number five. And let's say I want to set it on that beat there. So I'm now gonna press the cue button, and that is now set on that beat there. And I can jump back to it by pressing it again. If I don't like what I've done with that cue point and I want to get rid of it, I can hold down shift and press the cue point and that will now disappear from that track and no longer be there. So let's move on now, move on now to saved loop mode. In saved loop mode, you can use each pad to activate an, a pre-assigned loop. In other words, a saved loop in the track where it'll loop a part of the track over and over again. So for instance, we have a save loop here that I've just activated. It's flashing to say it's, say it's turned on. Because the track's not playing, nothing's happened, but if we hit play on the track, it's now looping around this section here. It's gonna to get to the end of the loop here and go back to the beginning of the section. And you can see that the loop is colored there to tell us that that is what's happening. I can turn the loop off by pressing this loop button here. And now the loop will play past that save loop and continue playing the track as normal. I can jump to the second save loop here, which is at the outro of the track, and it's now looping the outro. So you can think of save loops like a cue, but it just loops at that point. Now you can also add your own save loops. Let's add a little loop at the end. I'll use a spare slot by adding a loop that starts there and ends there and that's added a loop at my start and end points, and it's kept it in beat because of the quantize function that's set here, which we'll talk again about a bit later on. Again, if I wanna get rid of the loop, I just set shift and loop, we'll get rid of that. So we can add our own loops, and we can also delete them directly from the unit. Auto loop mode will allow each of our pads to activate an automatic loop that a preset, we don't have to do anything here. It's just gonna activate at the point we are at in the track, a preset loop. So for instance, let's start this track playing again and I'll press this first button here and it's added a loop, which you can see of one, two, three, four beats. Turn that off, the track will continue to play. I can press the next button along and it's added a loop of eight beats. And at the top here, you can see 4, 8, 16, 32. This is telling us what we're going to add with pads 1, 2, 3, and 4 down at the bottom here. So if I switch to this one here now, we've now got a loop of 16 beats or four bars of music going on here. Now, if I press auto loop again, we get fractions of beats going on here. And it says at the top, a quarter, a half, one, and two. There's a quarter beat loop going on there a half beat loop, a one beat loop, and a two beat loop. And we can turn these loops off by pressing the button again to let the track continue to play. The other loop mode that we have is the roll mode. It's called roll on here, but you can think of it as a roll loop. Really, this is just auto loop with the the slip function is not called slip on this unit, but that's what it is. The same thing you saw in the smart scratch mode, where when you press the button, the track carries on playing underneath while you're doing the thing. In this case, it's gonna be looping. And then as soon as you finish, the track continues from where it would have been. It's a really musical way of using loops. I'm gonna to switch to loop roll and get the track playing. And then I'm gonna press the first pad. 
giving me a very fast loop there. Slightly less fast. Slightly less fast. Another one. That's actually a triplet loop for you musical types. But you notice the track is playing underneath and you can again see that by the way this is splitting the waveform. And again, we can press the button again and we can get other values of looping here. It's a good trick to use when you're in the mix because when you're in the mix you can keep two tracks in time while using loop roll on them to make your mix more interesting. Now pressing and holding the view button or swiping down from the top of the screen gets you to the control center and this is somewhere from which you can adjust some commonly used parameters which is what we're seeing on the screen here but also you can jump to user profile, settings, source, Wi-Fi, rec record, lighting, all that kind of stuff. This is the place where you can make all those tweaks to the way the unit works or to the way your personal settings work and also access things that haven't got controls anywhere else. And the biggest one of those is the lighting. So let's spend quite a little bit of time now going through everything that is here. Usefully, the things that are on the screen when you do that action are the things you're most likely to want at a pinch so they are easy to turn on or off without you having to dive any deeper. You have the quantize button that turns on or off quantize which to remind you enables time-based features like when you trigger cues and loops they will snap to the beat grid in other words they will happen on the beat according to uh, the fine-tuned settings for quantize that I'll show you in a little while. The next button along is continue and this one here decides whether the next track will play when the active track has ended in your playlist or not. Stop time is a useful one. We haven't talked about this one yet, but let's demonstrate it. I'll turn stop time up. It was currently turned all the way down. So with stop time turned up, when we're playing a track on one of our decks, when I press stop, it slows down a little bit like a record deck. How cool is that? And that stop time adjust can be used to get different feels to the way you, you stop your tracks. So for instance, we can set it to quite a low figure and that will stop our tracks quite quickly but it'll still sound pretty cool. Like you stopped a record really quickly. But if we set that to the highest point, it sounds like you've turned the turntable off to end the night. Awesome. So you can pretend you're playing good old vinyl, but in fact, all you're doing is altering a setting that's hidden in one of the menus in your Mixstream Pro. Pretty cool. Also here, we have Split Q. Split Q is a cool feature which decides when you are DJing how your headphones work. And Split Q is a way that DJs have traditionally DJed when they can't rely on a speaker near them in a DJ booth. And it puts the music that the crowd are hearing through one of your earpieces and the cued music through the other. So when we talked about the way this is set up and I showed you the way to use the, the headphones mix knob to mix those two things together, it was in both sides. This will let you always have the master on one side and the thing you're queuing up on the other. It's a way of DJing without needing any speakers. So some DJs are used to it that way. It's really good that they've got split queue on here as an option because it's not something that you see on a lot of smaller DJ units. Then we also have the crossfader contour control. This decides when you are moving your crossfader, how quickly the other deck moves in. If you have this set all the way to the right, then the other deck will be on full volume when you just tap the crossfader very, very slightly like that. They're both gonna be on full volume now. But when we have this control set all the way to the left, even when your crossfader is right in the middle, 
the decks aren't both on full volume, in fact, they're both slightly dipped. So it basically makes your crossfade a very smooth way of mixing between the decks or a very, almost like a switch. Uh, and this is a, a scratch feature. Scratch DJs will always have it set fully to the right. House DJs who use their crossfader more as a mixing tool will have it set somewhere more to the left. Leaving it in the middle is a good place if you're not sure on the crossfader contour. So then we get to dive deeper into these settings. So the first one I want to start talking you through is user profile. So user profile is something which is unique to you. You can tap the save to my drive button to save your settings to a connected drive. Now I don't have a USB plugged in here so I can't do this but usually any settings you have here can be saved back to your drive and then if you were to plug into another engine DJ enabled system, either another Newmark Mixstream Pro or one of the Denon DJ systems, it would remember all the settings we're about to talk about. In other words, it knows your the way you like to DJ and it will, it will take them back to Engine DJ on the laptop as well if you're preparing on your laptop and they'll all be remembered there. And so this is a nice way of setting everything up how you like it. It's not specific to the unit, it's specific to you. Let's have a look at them then. So we've got the track start position here. Now track start position will decide when we start a track playing, whether it plays from the beginning of the track or from where the first cue point is. Then we have the default speed range. This decides how much the pitch faders alter the tempo or the pitch depending upon what you like before you've changed it. So you can set the default to plus four, plus eight, plus 10, plus 12 or plus minus 50. Uh, normally you'd probably set it somewhere in the middle. You can have the sync mode and this decides whether when you press the sync button it syncs up to the nearest bar of music to the nearest beat or just matches the tempo. Again, this is something that will be decided maybe by how much you're used to manual beat mixing yourself. You can have the sync button action here, whether you press the sync button and it turns it on and you press it again and it turns sync off or whether you need to hold down the shift button and press sync to disable sync. Again, not really much in it for me, I'd leave it where it is. And then you have the pitch control type. Uh, this can be either pitch bend or range. This determines the, the primary function of the pitch bend buttons. Remember the pitch bend buttons? These two little buttons, two pairs of buttons here that you can use instead of nudging the deck. If you have it set to range, then the primary function of these buttons is gonna be changing the pitch range here. If you have it set to uh, pitch bend, then the primary use of these buttons is gonna to be to quickly nudge the deck forward or back. If you never use it to nudge, nudge the deck forward or back, you can set it to pitch range and then you've got a quick way of altering the pitch range. So you'll set that to the thing you use the most, basically. Now let's move along from playback to cues and loops. So in cues and loops, we have cue and loop quantization. This is what I've talked to you about a couple of times. This tells you how much the unit is gonna correct your timing when quantize is turned on. If you have this set to one, then whatever you do, turning loops on and off, turning cues on and off and stuff, it's always gonna to jump to the nearest beat. If you have this set to a quarter, it's gonna to jump to the nearest quarter beat. The values further to the left are gonna be more intricate, more musical, you can do more stuff with them. The values further to the right are gonna fail safe. You're DJing a bit more if your timing is not very good. Try setting it to half if you're not sure. Now the paused, hot cue behavior decides what happens when you press a hot cue on the unit. If you have it set to trigger, it's going to play from that hot cue when you press the hot cue, which is how this unit is set. If you have it set to momentary, then when you press a hot cue, it will play from that hot cue until you take your finger off the hot cue button and then it will stop again. Uh, and in that instance, if you want the track to continue playing, you have to press the play button while you've got the hot cue touched. It depends upon what you're used to here, and if you're not used to anything, leave it where it is, because that will be what you get used to. Uh, different DJ systems do that in a slightly different way. Then we have smart loops. Now, smart loops determine whether or not a loop will be automatically expanded or reduced to fit a, a known or unusual length of loop, two, four, eight beats or so on. Uh, this is something that you don't need on this unit because this unit doesn't have manual looping. Uh, and then we have move cue to loop in. This determines whether 
the song's initial cue point will automatically be moved to the start of a loop or remain at its current point when you start a loop playing. Again, this is a bit of an esoteric setting. I don't think you're ever going to care about that one, uh, but it's there if you need it. Now, some things you are going to be interested in here uh, is the way the display tells you about your tunes, whether it tells you the uh, metadata for your track title, i.e. artist and, uh, and track name, or whether it gives you the file name. Some people don't care about all this preparing their music and getting in the software and putting on the length of the track and, the, and doing the beat gridding and putting the name of it on. They don't care about any of that stuff. They download their music, they call it artist title in the file name, and they throw it onto a USB stick and they plug it into any DJ gear that they can use and they DJ from that. If you're one of those old school type people that doesn't do any of the fancy preparation that means you can use all the cool stuff on this and you just want to get music on a drive and play it, then you're going to want to set that to file name because it means that when you're looking at your tracks, it shows you the file name of the track, which is your way of seeing what the hell that track is. But for most of us who are in the 21st century, we're going to leave that set to metadata where we get all the cool stuff shown to us. Track format, uh, sorry, time format. This means, uh, it's quite a cool one, this. If you were to speed a track up, obviously the track's going to finish quicker than if you weren't to speed it up. And so this uh, respects that, uh, whereas the other setting won't respect that. Uh, and track end warning will give you a warning. It'll flash the deck uh, when the track's about to end and you can decide how quickly it does this. It's currently set to 30 seconds and that's probably about right. But you can change that if you want. Moving along to display. Sorry, moving from display to safety. These are all the features that will stop you looking silly uh, if you do something silly. So you can lock the playing deck, which is what the first one is. So you can't accidentally load something onto a deck that's playing. I thoroughly recommend you do that. Needle lock is what decides whether, you, whether or not you can touch the full waveform and jump to that place. Remember when I showed you that? while the track is actually playing. You can always do it when it's paused, but while it's play, playing. And padlock is not padlock as in something you lock a door with, but pad lock. Padlock will, will basically stop the pads working. You know, a lot of DJs, again, they're, they're not used to having all these pads and stuff. They just want play pause, uh, the, the pitch control and the deck. And so if that's you, you can turn all the pads off by pressing padlock. And that means that uh, you can't accidentally tap the pads and do things that you're not used to using and you're not interested in using. So that feature is there if you need it. So let's move down to the library features. So in here, we have got lots of stuff which determines how the library displays your music and various other things that are connected to that. The first one is key notation. So musical key can be described in various ways. And um, there's four ways that are given to you here. Uh, you can have it in normal, as in what you would get taught in music school. Key notation, you know, A, A flat, C, F sharp minor and so on. Uh, and there's two variations of that. You can have it in open key, which is how Tractor displays key measurements, or Camelot, which is how everyone else kind of does it. Uh, you're going to use one of these two if you're going to get into key mixing as a DJ because they're easier. And the one most people will use is the one it's set to by default, which is Camelot. Now, key filter will decide whether when you use the filter controls that I showed you as something you'll typically do after you've done a search, whether once you've done that, it only shows you tracks that match the current key or tracks that are compatible with the current key. Then we have BPM range. BPM range will determine the lowest and highest BPMs that will be used when the unit analyzes your tracks. So there's lots of variations here. We haven't really talked about this yet, so let me just talk to you very quickly about how this works. When you plug music into this unit, uh, or when you point this unit to music somewhere, uh, if it doesn't have the information already at hand about that track, it will have a look at that track and it'll decide a few things about it. It's musical key, it's waveform so it can draw a pretty picture of it for you uh, and it's BPM by looking at the beats in the track. Now if you always play fast music, drum and bass and so on, then you're not interested in it trying to figure out whether that's a slow track or not. So setting that setting there, the BPM range to a higher range is more likely to give you accurate results. But if you're a down tempo DJ or a hip hop DJ and your tracks are typically in the lower BPM range, you're going to want to set it to a lower reading a lower a lower range so you get more accurate results for you and there's different 
different ranges there depending upon what you are including big wide ranges if you play a bit of everything so you're going to want to have a look at that and set it to something that makes sense for you or just leave it as it is if you're not sure the worst that can happen is that you get a few tracks analyzed with the bpm at half of what it should be or double what it should be uh, and that isn't the end of the world because they'll still due to mathematics and due to the way these units work they'll still be mixable even if it's got it slightly wrong in that way Moving back then, we have BPM filter tolerance. This decides when you, again, when you're using the filter, how much the unit will respect the BPM of all the tracks in your filter results against the one you're currently playing. If you have this set to naught, then it will, let's say you're playing at one to one BPM. It will only show you your tracks that are also one to one BPM. If you have it set to about 10, or plus minus 10, then you're going to get tracks that are plus or minus 10 from the track you're currently playing. You'll get more tracks, but it means that when you're DJing, you're going to have to move those pitch faders a little bit more or press the sync button and the sync button will do it for you to move the track further away from its original tempo in order to mix with the one you're currently playing. Again, you're probably going to want to set that to plus minus five or maybe plus minus 10 if you don't own very many tracks so that you get some results. And again, it's going to depend on the kind of music you play. Uh, some DJs really don't like mixing tracks with other tracks if the BPMs weren't originally very close. If that's you, you can make that setting there. So the final two settings, collection, browse behavior. You can choose select or open here. And this just determines whether you need to tap once or twice on something in your collection uh, in order to open it. So this is just if you've got clumsy fingers, you might want to change that one. And the final one, demo content, decides whether or not you see the demo tracks that I've been using all the way through this tutorial. I suggest that as soon as you've got your own music in the system, you'll be turning that one off. And then the final tab is a very easy one. Uh, it is deck colors, but it doesn't count for this unit because you can't alter the deck colors on this unit anyway. Uh, but if you could, this would alter the color of the record deck on some units. This will give you a green deck on the left and a blue deck on the right but certainly as far as I've seen there's no way of that actually showing anywhere when you're DJing so no need to go and alter that there. Now it's time to move on and look at the settings. These are the things that are set for this unit. They don't travel around with you on your USB or your SD. These are set for this unit. So you're going to set these once and then the unit will always respect them. We have on the settings tab at the top here then device, mixer, mic, services, and about update. Let's start by looking through device. So we can turn our Wi-Fi on and off here, and we also get a way of looking at all the available Wi-Fi networks before we, uh, we get those set up. We've got the time and date, which again is useful because it can timestamp your history of when you've played stuff, and that can go back to your engine DJ desktop software, altering the time zone here as well, and you can decide whether you set the time zone manually or not, just like you do on a computer. Uh, nudge sensitivity decides how sensitive the jog wheels are to you nudging them here at the size of the jog wheels. So you're going to set that to somewhere that's good for you. It's by default set to high and I suspect that's going to be where you leave it. Default scratch mode decides when you turn that scratch button on, whether it goes into the scratch mode that I've been showing you where it respects where the track would have been had you not scratched or whether it just goes into what most decks would do when you hit scratch which is let you take control of it manually and carry on from uh, where you left off uh, when you finished. Uh, so if you like the way the scratch mode is set up and you like being able to basically have that, those training wheels on your scratching leave that where it's set by default if not you can set it back to normal. Track preview just turns the track preview on or off where I showed you tapping on the artwork to preview the track. Some people don't like track preview because they tap it by mistake basically so that's going to fix that for you. Preview volume just determines the volume that's going to come out of your headphones when you tap that preview button uh, because there's no separate volume control for that. It's not going to be affected by the headphones volume control separately to everything else so that's a way of getting that volume right so you're not deafening yourself or conversely you can't hear what's going on when you do that. Oops I've just uh, gone too far there. Screen brightness decides how bright this screen is here. You're going to want to turn that up very very high when you are in a daylight situation uh, and you're going to want to turn it low when you are in a very dark place because you don't want this blinding you or interestingly when you're filming it because even in the low setting down here uh, it is quite bright when we're filming it uh, there 
uh, but I have it set to mid so I can see it as well when I'm talking about it. Uh, so anyway, that's screen brightness, that's what that's going to do for you. Now, mixer is, as you would imagine, some controls that set how the mixer work on the unit. So we have the playlist deck crossfade time currently set to three seconds uh, which was what I guessed would be a good uh, good setting wasn't it when we were talking about it but you can alter this uh, if you really don't like the idea of the unit trying to crossfade your tracks together uh, you can set that to naught and it'll just play the tracks one after the other uh, or you can set it a little bit higher if you're playing lots of very laid-back music with big beatless intros and outros and it doesn't really matter that it's uh, smoothing them together a bit more. Then we have the VU meters. This is quite an interesting one. This decides whether the meters in the middle, remember I showed you the meters and said don't go into the red or the white as it is in the case of this unit. It decides whether the meters are showing you the main output as determined by the main volume or whether they're showing you the output per channel as decided by the level controls. Uh, so you get that choice. Uh, and if you're being belt and braces, you might want to switch between the two at times uh, to see that you're not uh, overloading the channels with these or driving it too hard from the main up here. And filter resonance decides whether the filter controls at the top of the unit that you can actually just see, these two big controls at the top of the unit here, uh, whether the filter controls are very, very musical, they have a very musical filtery sound, or whether they're just like big kind of EQ controls. Uh, and this decides whether that is the case. By sliding it down, you get slightly less, uh, like less musical filters, if you like, and sliding it up, you get the most filtery filters possible. Let's move on to mic. Uh, only one setting here for the microphone, but it's uh, quite a useful one. Uh, this decides whether when you've got a microphone plugged into the unit, into the socket at the front, remember I told you there's not much that, that, that happens with the mic here. It just goes in there. There's a volume control, goes out the back, but that decides whether the microphone comes out of the speakers that are built into you, the unit or not. Uh, and I suggest that you have the microphone set so it doesn't come out of the speakers, so you're less likely to get microphone feedback. Uh, but you do have that button there to decide that. If you're only DJing with this thing, with no extra external speakers, and you like the idea of people hearing your voice as well as the music through the speakers, uh, then you might want to, for some reason, set that to on. So moving across to the services tab, this is where we can turn engine lighting on or off. I'll talk to you about how this unit can control lighting in a bit. It's where we can turn Ableton Link on and off, and this will let you sync up with Ableton Link over Wi-Fi, which is really cool if you want to bring Ableton or drum machines and sequences and so on into your performance. It's a really powerful feature. Then we've got our four streaming services that are currently available at the time of speaking, uh, of recording this. BeatSource Link, Beatport Link, SoundCloud, and Tidal. And then we've also got our Dropbox Cloud. And this decides whether it accesses our personal Dropbox in order to get music out of the cloud that we own. Because with this unit, you don't only have access to cloud music that you subscribe to, but cloud music that you actually own as well. Uh, it's a good tip, by the way, uh, and I think I mentioned this earlier, to put, even if you are using cloud services, and even if you are using your own music on a Dropbox, to put a good quality SD card, and that's better than a USB because it just slides in and then it's kind of like not visible, uh, into the unit because when you're messing around with cues and loops and so on, uh, with that music, it needs somewhere to remember that stuff and it will remember it on that SD card. You'll find that you don't get some of the functionality that you might expect if you don't do that. So. There's very little on the final tab of any interest to you. It's just going to tell you the current OS you're running. Uh, you can uh, update the firmware over the air if the firmware isn't up to date from here. Uh, you can restore all your settings to how they were when you got the unit if you just want to sell it or you just think you've messed something up and you want to make sure that uh, you haven't. Uh, and you can turn on or off the privacy setting there. If you don't want to be sending anonymous user stats back to, uh, to Engine, then that is the place to turn those off. And uh, you've got uh, all the legal stuff tucked away here as well. Uh, and that's it. That's, uh, that's everything that is in the settings menu. We just have to look at source, uh, recording, and at Wi-Fi, how to get the Wi-Fi switched on. Uh, and then we've pretty much covered everything apart from lighting, which I will show you briefly. Source is here. And as we looked at earlier, this is where you're going to see the sources that are available to you. The one we've been using is our demo tracks. The next one along is Wi-Fi. We've already shown you another way of getting to this, but there's a quick way of getting to your Wi-Fi network and joining one. 
And the next one along is record, which we haven't shown you yet. Uh, here you can record your music. There's nothing plugged into this unit to record on. If I had a USB plugged in, there'd be a big fat record button there. I can hit record and record what I'm doing. Now it's worth bearing in mind that you can't record stuff from streaming services. It's a real limitation of streaming services that there's a licensing stipulation that says DJs aren't allowed to hit record on those things. So if you do want to record your practice sessions or your sets and you're using streaming services, you're going to need another way of doing that. It's not going to work in the unit itself. And finally, let's have a look at lighting. So lighting is easy to do at home with Philips Hue lights. And we've actually made a video uh, talking you through how that works and showing it to you. It's at the end of our Engine 2.0 overview video. So I've linked that underneath. So I won't demo it now. I'll just show you where the settings are if you wanna play with this for yourself. And it also works with DMX lighting, which is pro lighting. Again, we've got some tuition coming about that, uh, which works not only with the new Mark Extreme Pro, but with all engine DJ uh, OS installed equipment. Uh, however, for now, let me just show you where those controls are. So in order to activate it for the first time, you're gonna have to head over to the uh, services page. So we're gonna go back into the settings. Uh, we're gonna go to our services. Uh, and then we're gonna turn engine lighting on. Uh, once we've done that, uh, we can tell it whether we wanna use Philips Hue lighting, DMX, or uh, whatever we've got to use with it, uh, and we're, we're ready to go. And then to get back to that in the future, uh, you just hold down Shift and press this button here uh, at the top, uh, which has got lighting written by it. And it takes you to this screen here, which has got the three tabs across the top for your general settings for smart lighting, your DMX interface settings. DMX is the pro lighting systems that are used in clubs and used by mobile DJs, and they're powered by sound switch. This is uh, the sound switch interface. This is actually the interface. It's just a little cable that plugs into the back of your unit. And then the other end of the cable plugs into a DMX lighting system. And that's a subscription system for pro DJs. What's probably more interesting for most DJs on this though, is the way that it works with Philips Hue lighting, smart lighting for your home. And by tapping the Philips Hue tab here, uh, you can then connect it to a Philips Hue Wi-Fi hub and get immediate control and it literally happens immediately over those lights. And this panel here lets you decide how that works. It will give you auto lighting that's based around the music, not just flashing to the beat, but based around the dynamics of the music. And you can tie it to the crossfader and the upfaders and make sure that when you're blending and scratching, the lights are responding accordingly. But here we have the ability to do loads of other things, white out, black out, strobes. Uh, we've got color overrides, so you can choose basic colors that you wanna use. And there's even genres that you can set here for the music. And like I say, if you have a Philips Hue lighting system in your home, once you've connected this, which is as easy as connecting to a Wi-Fi network, they will just work with this system, which is really cool. Wow, so there we go. Look, this is a phenomenal unit and you've got everything you need here to go from beginner to really quite proficient in your DJing. There's nothing else quite like it at the time of recording this. Now this video has given you pretty much everything you could possibly need to know about the operations of the Mixstream Pro, but it's not the full picture because as we told you at the beginning, there are five areas to learning how to DJ and we outline them in the book. I'm gonna tell you in a second how you can get a copy of this for free. They are gear, music, techniques playing out and promoting yourself. And I've just been talking to you about the gear. We've been looking at everything that this piece of gear does. Now, this isn't even all you need to know when it comes to DJ gear, if you want to become a DJ, because you need to understand the rest of the gear. You need to understand mixers and PA systems, microphones, and all the other stuff that is required to do the job. So the geeky stuff needs kind of fleshing out if you're new to this, but then there's music. As I said at the beginning, you need to know where to get the music, arrange the music, what's good, what's bad, how do you get the DJ tracks? There's techniques, what to do on the gear, how to actually use the music in the gear to make something good coming out of the speakers. And then there's performing, playing live, getting out there, programming music, reading crowds, getting yourself into uh, the zone so you can do a good job when there's a party going on. And as I said again at the beginning, there's promoting yourself. How do you then push yourself forward so that you can get the opportunity to DJ in front of other people? All of this stuff is not hard to learn, but if you don't learn all of it, you will find that you're not progressing as a DJ and it can be very overwhelming at the beginning. So the book will talk you through how to do that, how to learn just enough in all those areas so you can start playing your first gigs. You know, the problem with 
DJ training and people who try and teach you to DJs, they know that what you want is to do the cool stuff on the deck. So most DJ courses are all about mixing and transitions and all that kind of stuff. That stuff is important, but without the rest, without knowing how the gear works so you can be sure that it's gonna keep working when you're playing in front of other people, without knowing where to get the great music from and how to turn what you can hear in your head into a set of tracks that you can actually play to other people, without knowing how to program that music properly so you're not boring the dance floor, but you're also keeping yourself happy by playing music you actually like, and without knowing what's really required of you as a DJ, so you can talk to the people who are likely to book you in a language which gets you the gigs. You know, without all that stuff, knowing how to mix isn't gonna get you very far. So I want you to have a copy of this book and. All you gotta do is join Digital DJ Tips. If you're not already a member, head down there and go to digitaldjtips.com slash join. It's free to join. We send you a weekly newsletter which will help you improve in your DJing with lots of free tutorials, product reviews, uh, and uh, opinion pieces and so on about learning to DJ. But also, I'll give you a PDF download copy of the book. So go to digitaldjtips.com slash join and become our latest member. Now, when you're ready, I would be thrilled to have you as the latest student on our groundbreaking and most popular flagship DJ course. It's called The Complete DJ Course, and I teach you personally through the five steps that are outlined in the book. It's about an 80 video course, it gets bigger all the time, and it's got absolutely everything you need to DJ on the Newmark Mixstream Pro or on any DJ gear. So if you want me to personally teach you about the gear, the music, the techniques, there's three long, modules on techniques, talking you through classic DJ techniques, modern digital techniques, and how to apply those DJing in different music styles and genres, and then on to how to program and play and read crowds and do that stuff in public, all the way to promoting yourself and getting your first gigs, then do come and take a look at the complete DJ course. As I say, it's a phenomenal investment in your DJing, especially if you're a beginner, and I'd be thrilled to have you as my latest student on that. Meanwhile, I hope you've enjoyed this. Let me know what you think and any extra questions in the comments underneath. But for me, get good, get out there and make the moments. And I'll see you again very soon.